Hello and welcome to All Indians Matter. I am Ashraf Engineer. A few months ago, the government released the India State of Forest report, claiming an increase of 2,261 square kilometers in the country's total forest and tree cover. This figure was immediately contested by experts. They say it's a result of the government changing its definition of a forest. Now, tea estates, coconut plantations, and even tree-lined avenues are being classified as forests. Starting in 2001, the State of Forest Reports changed the definition to include lands of at least one hectare area and with 10% or more tree cover, regardless of the tree species or the purpose for which they were grown or their ownership. So even mango orchards and homestead gardens of suburban housing developments in congested cities are classified as forests. All Indians Matter we have on the show Stalin D, an environmentalist affiliated with the Mumbai-based NGO Vanashakti. His passion for environmental protection and conservation has resulted in many successes, including keeping wildlife corridors in the Western Ghats from falling prey to mining, securing protection for wetlands in Maharashtra, protecting mangroves in the Thane Creek and in Sivri, saving more than 3,000 trees from getting cut for a road widening project in Wada, campaigning to protect 3,000 acres of open spaces and forest land in RA colony in Mumbai from being taken over by developers. And he was instrumental in getting Mumbai its second wildlife sanctuary, the Thane Creek Flamingo Sanctuary. Stalin has filed more than 25 public interest litigations to save our environment, forests, rivers and wetlands. Welcome to the show, Stalin. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me on this show. Thank you so much. Stalin, the change in definition makes one wonder whether forest cover has in fact reduced. Could you clear that up for our listeners? See, if you look at the last three decades, we have been struggling to get the optimum figure of 33% forest cover. We have always hovered around 22-24%. Now, what has actually happened is that even that 24% is being eaten away. So now, the government has found a new way to mask this loss. They have taken up things which are not supposed to be included in a forest survey. So they have taken up all, like you had mentioned in the beginning, grassland, sugarcane fields, they are avenue trees, everything, everything. They have pushed it into it and made it appear like there is a lot of tree cover. If you look at the grandiose announcements made by the earlier government in the state, they said they had planted 33 crore saplings. Now, for God's sake, that's a ridiculous number to even throw out at people. Now, you, I'll promise you, that I will quit this space if they can show me two lakh saplings. Okay, it, it's absolute mockery of the law. 33% forest cover is a long way away. We are losing forest by the minute. If you pick up the newspaper every day, you will find that some at least at least about 100 acres or 100 hectares of forest in the country is being given away for some project or the other. Now, if you are what they are actually doing is just trying to throw dust in people's eyes and make them believe that there is a lot of trees and, and people also have, have to be blamed because they equate trees and forests. Now, that's a different uh, topic altogether which we should be talking about. But it's a sham. Why would any government make such an absurd change in definition? If you look at the Constitution of India and the Environment Protection Act, the Wildlife Protection Act, these are very strong uh, laws. They don't uh, give the liberty to the government to go and destroy what they want to. They have to demonstrate visibly that they are working within the parameters of the law. And the best way to do this is to confuse the people, the conservationists and the judiciary also. Because whenever, the jury, whenever a matter reaches the courts or the case is being heard, the first thing that is said is that, uh, so, sir, only 2,000 trees are being cut, but we are planting 5,000. Now, what is not told to the court is that 2,000 trees spread across, say, maybe 10 hectares is being removed. And in one hectare, you are planting 4,000 trees. So that kind of absurd uh, confusions are being created. And, uh, and the governments benefit from it. Because see, there is no money to be made. Well, politics, you now if you look at politics, at least in our country, it is the art of making money by plundering nature. Unless you destroy nature, you cannot make money. And you are, unless you make money, you can't remain relevant in politics. So it's a cycle. People have to be blamed for that. So scientifically speaking, Stalin, how are plantations and other now things included like tree-lined avenues, etc. different from forests? I mean, I just want to bring out to the listeners why it's so absurd to club the two together. 
three plantations i would call it as uh, industrial agriculture that is what you are growing trees which have value for your commercial users the ecosystem services are not part of the equation when you talk of a forest you are talking of a model of abiotic and biotic factors flora fauna interacting with the non living things living and non living things together combined together to create an ecosystem which sustains life in the absence of human intervention now a plantation cannot survive without human intervention but a forest will survive irrespective of whether humans go into it or no it is very simply said i would say a classroom is not a complete college a classroom may demonstrate part of the education process but it is definitely not a college or a university so when you talk of forest you are talking of a university when you talk of a plantation you are talking of a classroom so there is a fundamental difference in what we are talking about and forest cannot be equated with trees because like if you look at forest there are so many types of forest you have coastal forests you have shrub forests you have grasslands you have marine forests so how will you equate it with trees there are no trees in shrub forests you will see they all shrub just get rid of it in fact there was an attempt to do that also till people realized they hew and cry and it had to be scattered it had to be scattered so the fact is that trees are not forests it's a combination of a lot of things and what tells you it's a forest it is the ecological indicators which are present in it it is the birds that you find there the kind of mammals that you will see there the herbivores the carnivores everything together you mean you will find life which is there it is not just trees if you find look at trees you look at eucalyptus trees you look at acacia trees you will not find birds sitting there or even uh, nesting there that's because they simply know it's not right here this is not the thing that belongs here so every uh, forest is different from the other and trees are not the only factor they may be a factor but it's not the deciding factor whether that particular area is a forest or not absolutely what you're saying is it's not just trees it's actually an ecosystem right and what does the change in definition imply for forest conservation it's the change in definition only suits the government and its capitalist or industrialist lobby uh it is very damaging for conservation because it puts the conservationists and the environmentalists on the back foot trying to prove the scientific facts facts which don't actually need a for the enlightened or the person who knows it those who are well read in the field of environment they don't need any explanations but the what the government is trying to do is to weaken the conservationists base that they cannot argue they are talking of forest oh we've got so many trees that is equal to so many forests now if you talk that to a scientist or an ecologist he will he will chase you out of the door and say go get your basics right but that's the way things are this is just nothing to be entire what you call a, it's a circus this is going on do you think the change is a way to ease the handing over of actual forests for industrial development and you've actually alluded to it already while claiming that the cover is increasing exactly i told you i'll give you an example let's see that in the state of goa a couple of years back uh, declared coconut trees as grass that it's a grass really <laughs> now we challenge that yes we did that we went to goa we challenged it in the goa bench of the bombay high court and we had to withdraw that kind of uh, notification which they came, came up the real reason was there are a lot of lands in goa which are sought after by the liquor lobby for setting up breweries now all these coastal lands are full of coconut uh, palms so they are saying uh, the best thing to do is we are cutting grass we are not cutting trees so they try to do something as absurd as that to suggest that the coconut tree was a grass and not a tree so if you look at everywhere is the same thing they try to downplay the ecological value or the true significance or the worth of the tree just to allow industries to plunder those lands and lands forest lands are treated like it's like a free day to be distributed to all and sundry they will not buy the kind of land they will not they are talking of there is no mechanism in place first of all there is not enough land for reforestation there are no checks and balances see there's only a, the balance of convenience is always in favor of the person who is destroying it so they are trying to remove any possible hurdle for someone who wants to destroy the forest and you won't believe it uh, mercifully uh, even the honorable supreme court has what you call sort of sensitized itself at least one certain judges are sensitive they blocked a railway line which was coming through a forest through a sanctuary they said there is no need for that railway line people had to fight to turn nail 
and they got it cancelled. You are referring to the Goa agitation, if I'm yes, right. the Molem Molem railway, yeah, yeah, yeah the yeah. one against the uh, transport of coal. Yes, there was no transport there. As you mentioned in the beginning about three thousand trees which were saved. It was a tough battle for us to prove that what that project was completely unnecessary, and it was only aimed at allowing the timber mafia and the contractors to make money. What happens is people have become more aware and they have started challenging these kind of absurd projects and their destruction. So the best when you go to court, the courts are bound by the law. The role of a judge is to implement, see that the law is respected and activities take place within the framework of the law. Now what these people are doing, the government is doing, they are shifting the goalposts, they are changing the laws. So once you say there is a violation, they change the law and say now it's no longer a violation. Okay, killing someone is a crime. Tomorrow you say no, it's not a crime, so you can't be tried for murder. So it's as absurd as that the way it's going. But all said and done, it goes against the principles of our constitution, which clearly say that it's a duty of every citizen of this country to protect and care for wildlife and for animals, for the forest, for the rivers. And the state is only a custodian. It casts a responsibility on the citizen and as well as on the government. So mercifully. That provision still stands till the day they come and say, "Now the constitution has told you, just sit back and watch the fun." So we hope that doesn't happen. Of course, you know we know that forest cover has in fact been shrinking in regions like the northeast, for example. Now you worked a lot on the ground. Could you tell us some observations from the field? See, India has two important biospheres. I would say uh, uh, hot spots. When you talk of hot spots, these are areas which are under severe threat. One is the northeast, and second is the western Ghats. Both these areas are under under severe pressure from the mining lobby, from the sand mafia, from the loggers, from the timber industry, uh, from the infrastructure lobby. Everyone, everyone wants a share of the pie. And northeast and western Ghats are home to perennial rivers. So India's strength comes from its 400 rivers. We have 400 perennial rivers. and that rivers originate in the forest without forest there are no rivers as simple as that so when you destroy the forest of the western ghats all of the northeast you are plunging the entire nation into a water crisis it will not happen overnight in a decade it will surely happen so these are the spots like northeast also when you look from far it looks like a very nice uh, thick forest but you venture into it just a kilometer into the forest you will find that it has been completely deforested The same goes for the Western Ghats. It's plundered and ruined by mining, basically open cast mining. You look, take up Google Earth, look up the satellite map of Goa, look on the northern side. The entire thing has been scraped away. It's really heartbreaking to see the way things are going in the Western Ghats. So these are biospheres which need to be protected. Just, just for some perspective for our listeners, what role do natural forests play in maintaining the environmental equilibrium? Okay. Now, when you talk of forest, uh, the difference between the forestry and the plantation is that plantation suck water, forests provide water. It's a relation between the rivers and the forest. In the rainy season, the river gives the water to the forest, which again keeps giving it back to the rivers throughout the year in the dry months. It provides habitat. Flora and fauna depend on it for their survival. Uh, it gives you fresh air. It helps maintain climate. What you call resilience. The temperatures are down in the age of global warming. You need lower temperatures. You need fresh air. Okay, the pollution has to be tackled. So having forests is a plus for everyone, including the birds, animals, humans, the rivers. Rivers also have been given the status of living entities now by the court. The Madras High Court recently passed an order saying that don't treat the river like some ent- or something which is not alive. It's alive and it speaks to you. You have to understand that. It, it's like a mother. So, thing is that we have to respect the forest from a very selfish point of view. As a human, you still need forest if you want water. Desalination is not possible for the whole country. We may have a long coastline. Our logistical challenges do not allow us to take water to those quantities of water to the all of the countries. We are only going to create more climate change refugees. People leaving their villages, coming to the cities to work. The farmlands getting abandoned. The temperate landscapes turning barren. So forests today, the standing forests of today, are your last shields against destruction. For God's sake, value it and protect it. And they also play a very important role in the livelihoods of forest dwellers, right? There are some tribals and you know human beings who live naturally in forests. 
yeah but uh, now the thing is that now when we talk of livelihood those people who live in the forest they are the marginalized communities they are living a hand to mouth existence it's not the case that they are profiting from it but we have still yet to evolve a model that helps them to make money while keeping the forest intact either a case where the community forest has completely overrun a particular wildlife area or it's a case where the, the genuine tribals have been chased out so even we are not able to have a balance between both of it but yes there are a lot of forest communities whose needs are limited they are happy with what they have the forest provides for them they like for example they get uh, we may talk about gas cylinders for everyone subsidies and all that but no it's not true forest are uh, dead wood from the forest is still used for cooking purposes the forest lands are used for grazing by the tribals the honey uh, gatherers uh, still uh, use those from dead wood many uh, artisans survive on that so it, forests have uh, livelihood uh, what about benefits for the people who live around it so we need to maintain a balance between the forest and also the tribals who live there let's talk a little bit about mapping we know that forest loss has led to natural disasters crop losses human animal conflict etc why is mapping such landscape transformation vital for conservation landscape mapping you need to do to it is like a, it's a periodic blood test or a, a periodic physical health check up which you do it has to be done you have the data to understand where you are headed to whether you are better off or worse off than the earlier years the methodology of course leaves a lot to be desired uh, there is a big gap in that i really am not a big fan of the way it is being done right now uh, right now we are heavily dependent on satellite imagery for uh, estimating the density of a forest now a mother tree uh, keeps expanding its canopy with every year so what you really don't know how many smaller trees have survived so when you look at a forest you need to uh, look at the saplings the sub adult uh, trees the uh, young trees all those things those things are not done only on the basis of canopy you are estimating how many trees are there that method itself is flawed but having said that it is still important that we do it at least we have some starting point to start for the conservation of forests have you and the larger conservation community reached out to the government about this flawed manner of measuring forest cover definitely when the forest survey they had asked for uh, uh, they wanted to change the indian forest act and they had asked for suggestions and that's when we wrote to them how it is wrong and how the forest survey of india was report also should be taken with a pinch of salt and how the methodology was for everything is communicated to them not just by our organization i believe a lot of good people who understand these issues have communicated but the communication sadly is always uh, one sided uh, they don't talk to people who are critical of the government see the best way to for anyone to function is to talk to your critics so that you know where you are not get surrounded by yes men and say okay i'm doing great job here there are 10 people who are my friends who are telling me the same thing no you got to listen to those who criticize you also and and ponder the government has no desire to engage with people uh, who are critical of them so they want to behave in a manner which re- really doesn't do justice to the cause what changes would you recommend in the way forest cover is calculated in india if you ask me i would say ki first of all uh, you need to define if you're going for the tree cover then you should the health of a forest should be measured by the uh, amount of young trees which are there along with the mother trees and the sub adult trees what is happening is forest fires are responsible for destruction of almost 60% of the forest today so when the forest fires rage all these saplings and uh, the younger trees die so you don't know that when and the mother trees have a certain age the trees also have a certain age and then what happens is that when uh, new forest don't generate then that's a serious cause of concern so you go to into a forest you can create a grid it's called a grid mapping you create a grid of say 1 km and you make 1 km by 1 km and then measure the trees in it and then go by satellite imagery and then make a calculation how much it is but in that 1 km you will have to do that random sampling at all points in the forest or maybe even 500 meters inside the forest randomly so you know really what is the health of that forest it's not only about the trees and what state they are in for example you may have a forest which has more than say 10000 big trees but that is not an assurance because those trees need to be supported by the younger ones who will take their place as when you don't see the younger ones then you should realize that you are in trouble it's not really good for us tell us about vanashakti and the work it does well vanashakti uh, i would uh, say that it be address conservation in its true sa- meaning Uh, we engage in a lot of activities we have educational programs with schools with csr groups 
uh, with colleges, uh, with communities. So we have a lot of awareness and educational programs for them. We provide uh, sustainable alternate livelihoods for people who are dependent on forest so that they don't have to go into the forest and cut those trees. We also um, do a lot of ground restoration work, uh, like uh, restoring degraded areas, mangroves, forests, where uh, the land has got degraded. We have the technical expertise and we have done it successfully in many places. We also take care of rivers. Rivers are very close to our heart. We are tackling uh, river pollution on a very big scale. Uh, in fact, uh, we have a landmark judgment uh, from the Honorable Supreme Court of India. After a eight-year battle, we managed to get the government to pay 100 crores as penalty for polluting the rivers. It has never happened in the history of this country. 100 crores, the government paid as saying, sorry that we are polluting the rivers, we need to correct our acts. So the rivers and then wildlife corridors have to be protected. The Western Guards, we are fighting for those also. We have a section which is devoted to litigation also. But we do a lot of community work also. But unfortunately, the community work and the educational programs are not reported as widely in the media as they should be. We also create biodiversity, smaller, uh, what do you call it, model biodiversity areas like butterfly gardens, and stuff like that. So we are doing a lot of work. We are a small team, but we are scattered. And we try and do things to the best of our abilities. And we, of course, are in the forefront for policy issues. We will take it up. If it's wrong, we will petition, we will challenge it, and we will get it corrected. For example, just uh, last month, a couple of uh, last year, the government came out with a letter saying that, okay, you go ahead with the constructions in the coastal zones. We will handle it later on. Without permissions, you can go on. We said it's absurd. It's uh, completely absurd. We got it stayed. The court has stopped that fun that order from getting operational. So we are on hands-on on conservation in all parts. It depends on the, who calls us for what. But we are there, but we are here, here to help people, help communities. Coastal communities work very closely with us. We understand their issues. We try to help them in every way possible, even say the sea level rise impacting coastal villages. We have addressed those issues also. It's a very big canvas. We can have a special show for one Shakti if needed, maybe sometime later. So with that, uh, you know, there's a question I ask all my guests at the end of the show. Why do you do this work? I do it for myself and I do it to make sense of my life. And I wish everyone else thought the same way. Uh, what are you here for? Where you where you sent here for... Uh, making money and indulging in material uh, pursuits and enjoying your life. Of course, that's necessary. But there has to be a purpose for your life. And I find it as a purpose in my life that I want to protect. I want to keep something for the children of tomorrow and for myself also. Nature belongs to everyone. And uh, it's a gift from God. You don't have to go hunting for God everywhere. He's right around you all the while. You need to look around you and find it. And you'll find peace in yourself in that way. Stalin, thanks so much for this. Uh, for us, uh key to our progress and, in fact, our long-term survival. How we approach conservation will be the key to preserving them. So thank, thanks for this conversation, Stalin. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Thank you all for listening. Please visit allindiansmatter.in that's A-L-L-I-N-D-I-A-N-S-M-A-T-T-E-R.in for more columns and audio podcasts. You can follow me on Twitter at Ashraf Engineer that's A-S-H-R-A-F-E-N-G-I-N-W-E-R and All Indians Count that's a l l I-N-D-I-A-N-S-C-O-U-N-T. Search for the All Indians Matter page on Facebook. On Instagram, the handle is All Indians Matter. Email me at editor at allindiansmatter.in. Catch you again soon. <laughs>